in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. Department of Labor. Through this webinar, we encourage you to submit your questions or comments through the WebEx chat box on your site, and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. My pleasure to turn the call over to Ms. Betty Locke, Women's Bureau, Region 10, Regional Administrator. Thank you again. Hello, welcome everyone. Again, I'm Betty and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar, Women in Transportation and especially Northwestern Women Moving America. You know, despite great advances in educational attainment and professional attainment over the past decades, many women continue to face gender-specific barriers that inhibit them from obtaining occupational integration, equal compensation with men, and fair treatment in the workplace. Today, our focus is on non-traditional occupations and more specifically in transportation careers. We have three amazing women panelists who will discuss employment needs within the transportation industry. They represent trucking, maritime, and aviation and they will talk about how women are changing the labor market. They will share their personal strategies and recommend solutions to combat continuing gender stereotype, employment bias, and wage gap in, in um, do dominated workplaces. Mostly, they'll tell you why they got into these career pathways and why it's worth it, why they would encourage more women to get into these career pathways. Um, Time, what I'll do is I will go ahead and, and um, um, present a biography of our panelists and we'll um, um, turn it over to them. Our presenter is Desiree Wood. Desiree is the founder and president of Real Women in Trucking. It's a nonprofit agency that helps women entering into, the, uh, into truck driving training and it provides information to keep them safe and increase their chances for success during this critical year of truck driving. She has a personal blog, Trucker Desiree, and she's also a YouTube channel. As a long-haul truck driver, Desiree frequently travels a route in specific northwest port areas to deliver specialty dairy products. Three, you're here. here. Um, our second presenter is is Captain Kathleen Sweeney. She is the CEO of Compliance Maritime. Um, they are a provider of independent internal auditing of security, safety, quality, and environmental management systems for vessel operators. Kathleen Sweeney is an experienced master mariner, safety expert, and federally licensed pilot for over 25 years in the maritime industry in the greater Puget Sound area. And our third presenter is Ms. Rebecca Berge, and she is the president of the Washington Chap State Chapter of Women in Aviation National. And um, she will provide young women with encouragement, guidance, and support to pursue aviation career goals. Um, and she often appears at career fairs, aviation activities, scholarship, and mentorship um, uh, Activity. Rebecca is a pilot and flight instructor for flying teaching in vintage and specialty aircrafts from the 1920s through the present. And this includes World War I and World War II military aircraft. Um, currently, she works for the Boeing Commercial Airplane Company on um, 787 Interior Change Management, um, and they are located in Everett, Washington. Now, I'll turn the presentation over to Desiree. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me. This is Desiree Wood. I'm the founder of the Real Women in Trucking Incorporated Organization. Um, this group of 2010 pro Taipei women truckers were being marginalized and stereotyped in our own industry. Only women entering truck driver training are making it becoming qualified according to trainers in our organization. Today, we're going to 
501c6 member organization. Real women drivers delivering highway safety through leadership, mentorship, education, and advocacy. Next slide. I began commercial truck driver training in 2007. I was pre-hired with a large over-the-road fleet that trains to get out of my CDL school. See it going and it led me to use social media to share what I discovered. What happened was an isolated incident. I found it was an injury-wide problem and it wasn't being addressed. My he was jeopardized and it hindered my ability to remain in full as a truck driver. It also to highway safety and I wanted the public to become more educated on how truck drivers were trained. I'm a white native. I'm familiar with driving the Pacific Northwest. I often have picked up and go west coast portion. Heavy truck weak infrastructure stream winter in the mountain regions and the difficulty finding truck parking makes Washington sort of unfriendly territory for truck drivers. I'm currently in Florida and these are a few pictures from the road with my dog who I picked up my first year driving to the gray. As I social media took to share my concerns, my Twitter activity has been recognized internationally. My student trucker was the basis of a series of investigative reports by Dan Rather. This is kind of when you consider that an individual that lives alone in the cab of a truck and lives in a physical life to be heard around the world. That's of a truck driver. It's isolated and it's alone. For a woman, it's even more isolated. So you have to be with yourself to enjoy this job. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Ten most dangerous jobs to hold. Women drivers make up about 6.8% of the truck driver population, but I believe they're about 20% because on the road they are very visually present. Due to the discrepancy along the way, these women are calculated. Women are as independent, emotionally able to work and travel alone committed to highway safety, resourceful, they have good trip planning skills. Truck drivers have a reasonable level of upper body strength to maneuver between 75 and 100 per town. You have to climb, um, you have to be able to buy trailer um, problems, inspect engines, and them repaired. There get your hands, your hair, and your clothes dirty every day. There's some that don't schedule freight appropriately, and because a first person is going to find it shocking that a day hour is a luxury and not a privilege, because it takes precedence over personal needs. We need create solutions to create a food lifestyle for themselves when they're on the road. It's a job for everyone, regardless. Of gender. Next slide. Are not seeing. They've been driving big, big rigs since World War the World era, and they've been mostly invisible in transportation history timelines. Serve as an expectation of women, even from women in different sectors of the industry. The image of women truckers has always been heard, but it's helped them get dignified recognition. In 1918, Lewis was used to promote truck equipment with a message that said, it's so easy for a truck, even a woman can do it. This was didn't really travel far for, for work if they traveled at all. Lewis traveled in an open top truck from Wisconsin on transcontinental tour. In 1918, Lucky Dow was the first woman truck operator to drive over the Alaska Highway. Truck drive that are so unnatural an occupation that it can stand she around the state of California to take the children to really do Bitsy Gomez. Bitsy was with the coalition of women truckers. They exposed them, and this is still a issue that's prevalent today in some starter trucking companies. We're saying 
are expected to be the person they know about. Next slide. Women who have information about entering truck driving today are getting the wrong message about what it takes to be a truck trucker. Naive to exploit and driver training is isolated. Women must be for the work. But the function of women and truckers from both a sexy promiscuous outlaw the industry sponsors events for beauty contests over ability. The imagery of petals gives a sense of cohesion that doesn't exist. There is limitation in work ethic. And therefore we're seeing less serious candidates enter in the training sector. Shapes and sizes and ethnicity. There's grandmothers, mother, daughter, team, sisters, many drivers preferring the pursuit of the road. Most of the entering trucking today are between the ages of 42 and 55. There are some who are over 65 years of age. Um, they, um, some of them on the road, 30 or 40, really all we know how to do. Our vice president is pictured in the upper left corner of this floor. He's 75 this June. But it's important that seasoned women truckers were introduced to the occupation by a spouse, a father, and they learned for a long, long period of time. This is not an entry level truck driver training environment. There are to success here. Yeah. So, what we need to do a personal assessment of them to be honest, the specific it takes to become a qualified driver. They have to have an attitude for driving, they have a responsibility to highway safety, the ability to be outside their comfort zone and be able to live and work alone. Periods of time. They have to be able to lift or maneuver at least 75 pounds unassisted. They have to be able to serve on very low pay for the first six months, be longer. Um, people carry going without a shower facility for a couple days. Red industry is promoting a women friendly trust with a message that says women are weaker than men, and they need these types of trucks to be encouraged to enter truck driver training. This is the there's many men who are barely five feet tall that began driving before there was power for steering. Truck will serve 11 hours a day with limited access to the bathroom, taking a truck stop. There's not meal choices available, no exercise. You will be driving, sleeping in a bus, extreme weather year round. Others have to have the courage to keep driving in a storm in a safe manner, but also common sense to shut down and park when it's no place to move. You can even can't. Not cut out to be doctors and lawyers, and not everyone is cut out for truck driving, regardless of your gender or your stature. So there's two parts of commercial drivers. Step one is choosing a CDL school over a CDL school. And step two is being hireable at a preferable starter company and get one year verifiable accident free yeah. employment. In order to do this correctly, you uh, have to do it in a certain way. Then you can go for a better paying job. There are state and federal grants available for training. There's reimbursement. Getting a conditional provider is common, and there is easy job placement. So that's why an FY organization was formed. I do want to know that despite the barriers, um, there are still discriminatory practices in some of the experimental um, jobs. Women are wage carrier. So I um, the two step process earlier slide, which says to your company first and see what they require before choosing a school. FAQ section on 
on our website. It goes in depth with some nonsense information on this. You want if you're going to be hireable before you invest in the school. A community program is always better than an enterprise email school that's available. And make you Google all for stuff with employers and schools, followed by the word complaint. The trucker report forum section is a great place to do this. Line. Um, license. They have a list of approved CDL schools. This is, but it shouldn't really be considered a guarantee of quality CDL training. I slide a little uh, brief on this map for this slide that I would consider to be preferable to private schools. Locals are more likely to hire a graduate from one of these community program. Remember an employer considers a qualified CDL candidate to be one that has been trained well, not fast. So paid the same regardless of gender. Um, they had median wage in nineteen eighty is still what the median wage is today, about thirty eight thousand a year, even though we hear more, it's really not. Um, first, drivers pay low after tuition reimbursement. It could be as low as 18000 a year. With tuition debt, it, you would make 36000 for the year. A lot of drivers are paid cents per mile. They're not subject to wage hour laws. They're all paid for driving, not waiting. And there's a lot of waiting. They call sweatshops on wheels. So this is a very stressful work environment. It can impact health and safety. Local job rents to pay is hourly. You drive fewer miles, but you're in a lot of traffic, a lot of weather. There's additional labor to unload the freight. And some of them might exceed OSHA lot. So mobility tests have been reported discriminatory women in some of the level jobs, as I mentioned, what I think is the job doesn't really require that much listing, or the test is different from women to eliminate them. Next slide. Making ability that allows starter companies to have access to new students to be aware that there have been ongoing sex assault or retaliation for reporting the conduct at some of the starter companies. A lot of entering trucking are from low socioeconomic conditions, so they're easier to exploit. So you get out from these um, starter companies. Do they reach driving as a phase of training, and do they have lead trucks? If they say yes, do think this is not focused on safety, they should be scratched off your list. Next slide. Personal, I'll reach out to a mentor group. Keep them informed through each stage of your first year. A lot of people don't want to ask for help until it's too late. And the personality type that's attracted to truck driving is a loner. It makes it really difficult to mentor and accept advice for other women. Not the same experience. Married women have a completely different experience than a single woman. But this does not mean you need to run out and get a man so that you can do what you need to do is learn everything you can you have access to your, your instructors. If you come up and offer assistance, but it's best to really decline and do the work yourself. That's how you earn respect from your fellow drivers. You should learn 20 or 30 years ago the environment is completely different. So when you're on the road alone, you'll meet a lot of people from different backgrounds. They sometimes don't know that they're being offensive. You have to be able to steer the conversation back to a professional level. Don't personal issues. It can be misinterpreted when you're out on the road alone. Through Facebook, social media, you've been able to have weekly um, ways to connect with people that aren't members to a um, way to have a support group, keep them informed um, specific as like winter driving, how to deal with difficult districts, how to 
support for human resources, equipment can help, finding a place part, stuff like that. Next slide. Be honest. You know, there's women that value highway safety, and they can enjoy a maintenance life, but they need to be able to plan accordingly. So, you have to be truthful in your recruiting ask about what the job response is. The question must be evaluated with an outside third party, and changes must be made. There's too many things in trucking that feed think that to comply with FMCSA regulations and not OSHA, not the OC, not the Department of Labor. So an outside third party analysis of this work or culture can help to see what's in journaling. Take out change. Comprehensive sexual harassment and discrimination in training is a weak system in many truck driver training carriers. Culture change must be reinforced with annual retraining must be clear, not empty threats. When there's a complaint, it has to be taken seriously immediately. And listen to your employees, especially the new entrants, since their employees have a right to safe training. Be able to create a healthy workout atmosphere that diminishes prejudice, bias, and sexual misconduct. Mental internal innovation business models the life for health. Women make great truck drivers, but they have family responsibilities. So some of the um, business models need to be rethought of the way that long haul and local drivers are trained and the driver conditions both areas need to be addressed to satisfy suggestions. And have training carriers out there, so we don't really need to become aware of where student fleets are, and they should not be the state on a or site. Last slide. If you have any of the strategies to attack women as truck drivers, you can email me. I just want to thank you very much for having me. Um, your webinar. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me uh, today. I'm really excited to be able to talk about the um, maritime industry as well as uh, other uh, out there for women to go to see today. Um, to me, um, the lower is. Uh, me and my new container ship that I took out of the shipyard in Philadelphia. Uh, it's about a $200 million vessel there. Some uh, left are some left at sea. So uh, I'd like to start about how I got into the industry. I started out at a four year maritime academy in one of the schools in the nation. I graduated with a bachelor of science degree, so it's much like the college. Uh, there were many women uh, at the school at the time. Uh, three uh, women in the deck, like myself, one was engine. However, uh, of the deck graduates, two of us were in the top 10%, and the third female wasn't far behind us. When I wasn't a lot of jobs, so I started out as an able bodied seaman and then my way up to a master. Uh, as captain or as master, um, it was hard to get because there wasn't a lot of jobs, but I was very damned and determined to get ahead and, and to upgrade my license and to keep going to the next level. Um, once there, it can also be kind of hard to keep. Uh, but, but I ended up as a chief mate, the, the level of captain or master. Uh, you get a little bit more respect because you're actually the person making decisions and some of the decisions uh, regard as to who gets who gets pay, and so that can be some respect. And then when you make it to captain, um, you're in charge, so there's not a lot of harassment or discrimination on board uh, the person in charge. Um, you know, you can still basically feeling getting there, and then 
if you want to move on further in your career. Are you different in that when you're out there, you're all, all by yourself on the ocean, you land your shipmate to make fun. If you have problems and you have an emergency and you have to abandon ship, you're relying on your fellow seafarers out there. Who will be up, also be your competition to some degree uh, to you. I participated in a few rescues at sea. And when I was captain, I rescued a ship sunk. A Japanese fishing trawler had sunk, and six Japanese fishermen were in the life raft. I managed to um, maneuver alongside the life raft and get all of the uh, aboard. And for that, uh, it was being in the right place at the right time, which is a uh, most of this industry is being in the right place at the right time. And I did get a, a few awards that and a human ship trophy, so that's pretty exciting. So operations, uh, life on board, commercial ships military in nature, like you would expect. Uh, Navy uh, type of situation. However, we do have a strong chain of command. The captain also called the master is in control of the vessel at all times. Uh, it's basically in the three departments, a deck, engine, and a steward's department. The deck department takes care of the navigation of the vessel. We have individuals called AB that actually steer the ship. So I'm there on, on the ship, uh, on the bridge, steering the vessel myself. Rather, I have somebody doing it for me. And most likely these days, um, most of the time, it's actually being done by a computer where we enter the route in and, and the computer steers the ship. But um, the second um, the is the engine department. The engine keeps, uh, keeps the belt going, keeps the engines running, the lights on, the hot water running, uh, the things that we need to keep, keep the belt moving from point A to B and all of its systems. This department keeps track of... Uh, uh, cooking all of our meals and cleaning the interior spaces, as well as the food in what's been considered the hotel. Um, this is highly regulated. The ships are built to a very strict construction rules and regulations. Once again, we're also very highly regulated. Federal, state, local rules that must be followed. Uh, local rules here, as well as local rules in, your, in the country you're going to. Um, uh, you have, have to know what those rules are and you have to follow them. Emphasis is put on safety. Um, safety of the vessel as well as the environment as we want to cause any oil spills. Um, you know, we can't throw garbage over the sides. Certain things uh, have to be done certain ways. Some of the rules we do have were uh, the horrific the events like the Titanic these are the Costa Concordia. Um, a previous uh, panelist spoke, uh, you know, it, you have to work twice as hard just to prove yourself. Uh, it can be highly demanding work, long hours, no weekends. Uh, when you do work twice as hard to prove yourself, sometimes it does get noticed. And um, some you're just used to it, it becomes second nature. I know for myself, um, I got noticed early on, and I uh, progressed um, the levels quite quite rapidly really, uh, faster than my male counterparts that I had graduated with. And I think it was a direct result of uh, being in school and having to work twice as hard. Plus, you know, um, at the end of the day, you can't get away. Um, you know, you're with these people 24-7. It's like you can go home and decompress, and that, that can be kind of tough at times. Uh, it can be a lot of work and on a platform that's always moving. We're way out in the open ocean, um, the, the vessel's moving, but also sometimes alongside a dock, the vessel can still move. I have to um, account for that and, um, and make sure um, things are tied down and, and stay safe. Home, um, obviously, there's isolation. Facebook out there, and um, sometimes we don't even have the internet to um, to send. And that that can be kind of hard. Obviously, you have seasickness. If you do are prone to seasickness, it's a tough tough career to go uh, be sick and, and nauseous every day. Um, aspects of the industry where you're not on the vessel, 
or maybe a vessel that hardly moves at all, like maybe a passenger ferry in, in inside waters. But if you are prone to seasickness, it can, can be rough. At times, very little room for error. A small error can really be made to news. Um, some chief engineers have actually gone to jail for some of their actions. Um, pretty far, far and few between. And there were some pretty good reasons why they did go to jail. Um, bias and gender stereotyping uh, as well. Um, and, you know, um, the stereotypes and the biases. Promotion discrimination. Some companies still have no women senior officers. Uh, and um, you still can't face the glass ceiling at times. Prayers, um, not easy, but the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. You have to hide that for yourself. Uh, and benefits, um, I worked on six months off. Actually, I worked two months on, and then I'd have two months off for vacation for two months and didn't have to think about anything really to go back to work. At times, it can be pretty quick going up the, the chain or the ladder. Uh, what part of the industry you're in. You know, every time something new, which I uh, always uh, thought was great, I don't agree, I, I, I knew. You can be really proud of your accomplishments, and when, you, when, you, when you're sure, what, when you tell people what they do, everyone's always um, really interested and astonished. Um, on uh, high seas adventures and travel, and if you're not on a, a run where you're going to uh, have enough time on your time off, you many of us have gotten through unions um, just um, as a as extra. Uh, quite a few of the ships that go uh, for are gotten green, um, those jobs are gotten through unions. Slide. I won't go through it all, but there's you have a four-year degree, or parts of um, uh, other act. Uh, I won't go about that. Obviously, if you have any kind of a or uh, engineer, uh, there are quite high demand. Personal strategies. I think finding the right mentor is a key. Finding somebody that might already be in the industry or knows something about the industry. You uh, the blanks that you might not know about. The working, you know, sometimes uh, somebody that is um, could be somebody that's positive and wants to help you could be a good mentor, but you need to definitely find the right mentor. Um, you have confidence. Uh, um, this is uh, one you, you kind of have to try it on and, and, um, and to put out a confident nature. You need a lot of support from your family and friends when you're gone. You know, you're gone. And so that might mean uh, doing a lot more of the legwork in these relationships, keeping in touch with them, letting them know when you're home, calling them up. I would journal to write it all down. And this isn't because you, you might need someday, but rather as a memoir and also look back to see what you've done and how you're feeling, how it was going. You know, things do get rough, take a moving average, you know, what do Today, what did I feel like yesterday? You know, what's it be like in a week? And again, what is the decision that I make 30 minutes from now, pre or whatever the metric you want to think about when things are going rough? You know, you might have to put up with a, a crisis that's in the store, but really, what's that the outcome? I think it's going to have an exit strategy because um, to be and where you want to go. And like, out how to figure out what's what's your next step. And when you ask questions, um, ask in a smart way, maybe do it alongside, uh, uh, but maybe not in a, a big group. Uh, sometimes questions in a big group, um, women asking questions in a big group, it can be taken the wrong way. And I would really suggest trying to uh, research and sleuthing uh, you need to ask a, a published I think you know, from the top, no level manager is ever going to effectively institute a change, such as women on board 
or women in top levels. Um, uh, management needs needs to to screen, uh, the change. You know, one token two means you're longer alone, but three is really needed on board uh, to make to make a statement. Last couple of so slides talk about job opportunities and internship. I think the the big to figure out what you um, do, uh, what what's available. The industry is vast. There's passenger vessels, ferry vessels, fishing. There's all sorts of research opportunities, and even the industry is very vast and different. Figure out what really gets to you, what what interests you, and go from there. Ask a lot of questions. Tell you to look industry publications both online and in print. There's a lot of information with the different types of industries, as well as who's looking for jobs. Uh, hearing uh, were big need hearing license and a huge shortage there. So if you're all interested in that. There's a core program. There's 43 programs. There's community colleges that you can go to, and the Coast Guard uh, website has a lot of information on the industry and centers of expertise uh, for the different types of the industry available. So um, again, um, my company, uh, now I provide uh, compliance auditing to these vessels that are being operated in a safe manner. And um, I get to go on board, on board now every day, but I do get to come home at night, which is nice. And um, another uh, slide that you can look, you can see if you have any questions, but I really want to thank you for your time today. Okay, now for Rebecca with aviation. Good morning, everyone. This is interesting so far, so let me add my portion to do that. As mentioned earlier, I am a commercial pilot and a certified flight instructor. I have been flying for a very long time point where I not necessarily want to admit how long I've been flying, but it has been roughly 37 years, so it's been a while. I have a variety of aircraft in that time, from very simple things to very complex things, from small to large. The really neat thing about airplanes is they don't care whether you're big or little, you're a man or a woman. Kind of like the ships that Captain Finn was talking about. If you do it, it doesn't matter your sex or your size, which is really, really great. I come from three girls. My dad always encouraged, allowed, and things that he did. We fished, we swam, we skied, we drove everything. Cars, trucks, farm equipment, boats, recycled airplanes, you name it, we girls did it. Proving one, the household was my mom. Being a generation, she didn't think that was proper behavior for girls, that girls should wear dresses and look pretty and not get dirty and, and not be found outside doing all those things, but we didn't let that stop us. We did what we wanted to do, and as long as dad was supported, we got to do it. As our local farmers and ranchers in area in southern Arizona, for checking cattle, fences, spreading seeds, spreading fertilizer, so this sort of thing. For those who grew up in that area, we had a nearby community college that offered pilot and mechanic training programs for aircraft. So we earned our licenses, and for my took business classes along with my pilot licenses and graduate two-year degree. Over the education, uh, flying, you're always Skills. You're always improving your skills, honing your skills, and adding to your ratings. You never stop learning. It's a definite push. It is a highly regulated industry. You have to meet criteria for those licenses to start with. You have the criteria to continue to use those licenses, and you have to maintain your health so that you're safe to fly. Well, 100,000 licensed pilots in the United States today. About 5% of them are women. Now, before I ask but that figure and say, my gosh, that's really low, that has not changed over many decades. It's why we talk on a very regular basis. And what the biggest obstacle tends to be us, women, ourselves, 
to be confident enough. We tend to think of aviation and flying as a career for women. We think of it as a career for men. So we have the perception that we can't do it, a lack of confidence, a lack of belief in ourselves. You still get families who will say, oh, oh I'm not, dearie, you're a girl. You shouldn't do that. But I think for us is exposure and faith in oneself and your ability to try something new, you can do it, but yes, you can do well at it. And as time has gone by, the industry, both male and female, is extremely supportive of women, almost the occasional Neanderthal in there from time to time, but for the most part, we support. The nation doesn't care whether you're a man or a woman. Challenges to learning to fly it and fly well are the same. You have to put in all the hours of book study. You have to put in all the hours of takeoff and landing practice. You have to put in all the hours of coaches and learning how to handle it procedures and all of those things that are wrapped up, not to mention you get some meteorology and some physics and and all those other little goodies. And your confidence level tends to go up greatly. More viable to have a career in the education field. Confidence in yourself. And that's really great to encourage youngsters, young ladies in particular, that type of challenge because men really like to hear this, but women tend to make really, really good pilots. We're thorough about how we learn things. We're not afraid to ask questions. And we wait until we get it right. Our ego doesn't get in the way. Also, smoother on the controls, just have a nice hand at this thing. So it's always a pleasure to help a woman learn to fly and watch her, her abilities and to become good at it and that wonderful, wonderful sense of confidence that comes along with it. The number of 5% of that 600,000 pilots. Aviation started to become more commercial back in the 20s, basically, when we were and the men had come home from World War One. It was a pilot. In 99, there were 18 ladies with pilot licenses. They were to compete with the men because the men were grabbing up all the jobs. There weren't enough jobs to go at that time. And the <laughs> it was pretty entertaining because you talk about some determined ladies. Sent out a letter to every one of those 116 ladies. 99 of them responded. Thus, the organization, the 99th, was born. And their heart was the president. And they used their 99 muscle to make sure they got their share of the jobs at the time. Even then, when they were really fighting gender stereotypes and society's expectations of women. One way since then. And you find women today, young every size of cockpit in every possible aircraft out there from the little, little to we have lady space shuttle commanders we have had women fly the latest flying aircraft the 787 the 747 all these so terrific what would be from now on would be to see even more women into the industry there. Um, organization Women in Aviation supports all into any type of aviation career, not just pilots. The 90 is usually supportive of women who are looking to earn their pilot licenses. Pilots Association and our Aircraft Association is very focused on bringing more and more people into the aviation industry. And quite frankly, they don't care whether they're boys or girls. We just want to have more people come to fly or become part of the aviation industry as a whole. Time to get involved. I was women in aviation conference in Nashville, Tennessee two weeks ago. There were thousands of attendees at this amazing conference. Every man was there, all the smaller lines, the cargo airlines. There are 
a number of universities and training schools that are available to help people earn those and also to get to at the same time because that's more important today than ever. It was the most hiring I had probably ever seen in one year in the whole career. I was just amazed, just overwhelmed. I couldn't wait to come back and share it with the, the, the to hear, share it with the young people that I mentor, share it with everybody involved to go, wow, this is just such a great time. So to you and to the that you act with, young and old, is that there are opportunities now, like probably before. All leaders are hiring. Now there's one caveat there. It's what Desiree mentioned about trucking. When you first start out, the pay is very low. Few years on a commuter airline, the pay is very low. But the opportunities to advance to a bigger airline and better pay, fortunately, are much closer than they used to be. So it's a great help. So remember that besides the airline, businesses use aircraft for many tools and effective uses in the course of the Small airplanes will run the president of a company over to see somebody two states over to on the latest prototype. They will take a level meeting in Europe. It's air going everywhere all the time. Thinking of an analogy when I was listening to the lady speaking, is the aviation department. The bulk of the truck travels by sea by truck once it gets on this country. And then the Walmart's airplanes are traveling around, making effective business decisions, holding meetings, doing the things that the company executives need to do in a very effective, safe, safe manner. So it's really, really a neat to think about the bigger transportation picture, how all of the industries that we are talking about make our world go around. It's a wonderful time to be involved with all of them. Forces the military. People are quite interested in the unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs, the drones available. And the most exciting that I think that is out there is NASA is hiring astronauts again. How incredible is that? Two things that makes me wish I was younger. I would be thrilled to go into space with NASA. However, you go into space with a commercial space. There's a couple of boats that are trying real hard to get people up there. So pretty much a young woman right now, and you can go to college and have an engineering degree and learn to fly, and you can get out at NASA, and the next thing you know, oh, you've got to go to Pluto or something like that. That is just absolutely fascinating and perfect opportunity. Just remember, remind your youngsters that we're here for them. And it just doesn't matter. I've had 78-year-olds learn to fly. I've had 12-year-olds learn to fly. So it's age there. It's purely health and ability is all that matters. And we're here to support and to help you. And if you run into a, a, a stone or a gender issue, we'll help you deal with that too. Fortunately, like I said, it doesn't come up too much. But it's, uh, it's our great pleasure to help more people, come along, more women come along in our industry and be successful because they're happy with their jobs. For the moment. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank all three of our presenters and especially for sharing your personal experiences about the careers, why you chose them, um, some stories about barriers and how you overcame some, some over the barriers. And um, also, at the end of each presentation, they've been, um, you've all included information on how our, our uh, participants can contact you, and I think that's just wonderful. Um, I'd like to turn to our um, the Women's Bureau launched a Women Build, Protect, and Move America portal last November, and um, we wanted to show you how you get more information about transportation careers. It is www.dol.gov slash wb slash uh, ntl. The, fir the first page you'll see is uh, 
this one, and then you'll scroll down. You'll find work, a workers tab and an employers tab. Um, see that um, there are other stories from women who have found success in non-traditional occupations, and there are places here where you can all share. Feel free to share your own story. We'll go ahead and click on the worker tab. So for more information, click the occupation information tab. With the web page open, you'll see the different um, occupation sectors, and transportation is on your far right. And you can click on this um, title and get more information about the transportation industry. Uh, as as many of you have been submitting questions, I'm going to turn this over to um, our uh, Princess Hari Chong, and um, she is going to handle the, the, the question and answer session. Um, I would like to also at this point thank Hari for all of her work on this webinar. Um, this has been her her project for us, and uh, without her, we would not be having this today. So thank you, Hari, for all your work. Now I'll turn it over to you. Ms. Locke. Um, so if you, uh, if you haven't already, um, please do submit your questions. Um, uh, look, uh, yes, um, please do use the chat box next, uh, on the right side. Um, we, and please, uh, um, name, uh, uh, the panelists that you have a question for. Uh, looks like we have, uh, uh one question, uh, for Desiree, are you on? Uh, this question is for you. Balance your career ambitions with starting a family. Most, uh, personally, my kids are grown up, and I'm a, a grandmother. But for women that are just entering, uh, and that haven't had a family, you the regulations against being a truck driver. Um, I encountered women that drove all the way up until eight months of pregnancy. That being said, though, the lifestyle of an over-the-road truck driver is really not um, good in relationships. You miss birthdays. You, you, it's just unpredictable when you're going to be home for the first day, for sure. Skype has helped um, some. If you have a strong family support system at home, it can kick kids. I really don't recommend it unless your kids are growing up, but if that's the situation you're in, Skype, um, Facebook, people to keep families connected when they're on the road. The tech skills to even do that with them that are truck drivers have limited um, technical skills with um, smartphones. And the group is actually starting some of our own webinars to teach how to use their smartphones and laptops and tablets better to use lifestyle uh, apps and, and things that can stay connected with family. Using the new technology available. Um, this question uh, here is for Captain Catherine. Uh, what are the most difficult challenges facing women in the maritime industry today? Phone. I think the biggest uh, challenge today for um, the industry is just knowing what part of the industry you want to work in and there, and hopefully you know someone, but people talk to had to know somebody because we're not very good um, um, for the industry. Um, the people just don't have a clue. Ninety percent of everything comes over over uh, over through ocean, you know, through container ships are brought somehow over the ocean. So uh, I don't do a very good job uh, of getting word out there that these are the the 
jobs are out there and, and what are the basic things you can do. Um, I think to figure out where you want to go, um, there's, especially if you're willing to work hard. hard. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Rebecca. Um, uh, the audience member would like to know um, uh, factors um, that helped you to pursue career in aviation. It could be personal or um, academic. Part of it is that I like challenge mechanical thing from a view. Academically, I always did well in school, so I didn't mind doing the school work that it took to do it. I think a lot was a support network around me that my dad was supportive and, you know, the people at, um, the neighbors were supportive and the people at school were very supportive. Um, so, so we sort of worked together that the support weighed the negative piece. So that would help. This for Desiree, um, uh, there are times that you can uh, recollect during your career where um, support system or um, or mentor group uh, didn't meet uh, what you were looking for or your needs. Uh, you know, I I initially joined another women instructing organization for support when I was having problems. And what I got was I was verbally attacked and stalked online for speaking about some of the issues I was encountering. Um, the same things that were in this presentation I had here today. Um, my membership was revoked from that organization when I started asking questions about some of their sponsors were assaults were happening in the harassment. That's an, that's those assaults still going on at that carrier. So, um, that kind of intimidation that was going on towards me and to other women. Uh, it's it's one of those why truck drivers don't speak out, especially women truck drivers. There's start some coercion and harassment. Um, through the FMCSA, but there's more than anything than like a paper tiger to the drivers. They don't really seem like sort of whistleblower protection or any kind of support. That's still not a solid advocacy, um, and our organization is is relatively low, but that's sort of where we're working with it is to give us a true advocate. Um, uh, we'll just, we'll take one more question, um, to respect everyone's time. Um, uh, this one, this question is for, uh, um, uh, how have you advocated for diversity without hearing your own career? I I have of for and career <laughs> I seem to have overcome it now. Uh, getting it was really hard, and a lot of people would say you're not another job. But on my resume now, and it's actually starting to find people that are like really, really what I'm doing, and they want to be associated. Want their business to be associated with me. So changing of the tides now, where people, you know, see. Thank. You. Uh, we see you next time. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, this is Betty and. Uh, Plan to ha hold more of these webinars, and if you have uh, suggestions, uh, 
would be very happy to take those suggestions and, and also suggestions for producing um, webinars uh, in, the, in the future. So thank you very much for your time and participation. I'll disconnect.